Alright, so assignment number five, then we're going to talk about tax parser, reviewing, and then we're going to talk about implementing our design. So the, the theme of this week is that the project has started. So we're going to be covering the things that you need in order to get the project done. So tax parsing was one of those things. We started it on Monday. We're going to continue doing that today. And then the second half that you need for that is implementing OO design. And so there's a bunch of readings that you need to do in order to, uh, to really understand what that's about. So today we're going to start on it, and then Friday we're going to finish OO design. And you should have by Friday all the information you need for doing project one okay, so it's not right now. It'll be a little bit confusing because there's some parts of it that are missing or like unclear to you. We haven't covered it. But after Friday, you should be all set. Okay. So I hope that all of you have a project partner. How many of you do not have a project partner? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have checked out the project phase one code? All right, that's a good sign. That's promising. Hopefully, more of you will do so on Friday. the quiz folder assignment. So here's the, uh, here's the solution for it. So in the assignment, you were supposed to do kind of two things, right? The first was you were needed to create a new division question class, the extensive question. And this class represents questions of the form constant divided by some variable equals some i constant. And so your task was really to kind of integrate this class into the existing questions package. And then also reason through the exceptions and how the exceptions would flow through the class and what we would do without. And so here's, here's the solution that we have. Uh, essentially, the constructor of the division question needs to call a super. So the question is super. And you initialize super with the same max mark that you got as an argument and a string, which represents your question. So this is one way to do this, right? I build my string in line by concatenating different things. So I concatenate the numerator, this little piece of a string, the result, and then I ask, what is that? So this is one way to solve it. The other way to solve it is to actually create a string that contains this, and then assign it to my question string after I call super. OK, so there's kind of a couple of different ways of doing this. But you have to call super, right? Because super initializes max mark, it initializes question. Okay. Uh, and then the second part of the question was getting the overwriting is correct. So it's correct here is gets called whenever a person enters some string for to answer the question, right? So the answer contains the string, and so step one is to actually convert the string to an integer. So you'll see this a lot in the, in the project, because in the project you'll be doing a lot of parsing. So you'll get a string, you'll need to break it up into little chunks, and then actually interpret those chunks. And so sometimes those chunks will be numbers, so you'll need to actually convert something that looks like a string to an integer, so that you can deal with it as an integer. So I, after I've done this, the next thing I can do is, uh, in my division question, is correct. I can actually uh, compute my result. I can check whether the denominator that the user supplied is actually correct. So this is my check here. And notice that I'm wrapping it into, into a little try catch block, right? Where I'm going to catch the arithmetic exception and return false if my exception occurs. So it's not the right answer if it's zero. Great. That's basically the idea. And then if, if there's no exception, then I return false. Because it sim this result does not equal new greater divided by the denominator. OK, so that was, that was the first half of the, half, half of the assignment. The second half of the assignment was to create another quiz type. So we have these different kinds of quizzes. 
One of these is each answer must be a right quiz, so it'll constantly query you for the right answer if you get it wrong. And so you were to extend this one and create a quiz type called half mark on each attempt. And what this guy does is every time you submit an answer, it's going to half your mark <coughs> if the answer is incorrect. So again, we have a constructor, it's much simpler in this, in this case, because we're just going to call super with a set of questions that we care about in this quiz. And then for submit answer, when the user submits the string answer, we're going to call super submit answer. And, and you know, the super might throw or retry answer exceptions. So in this case, we're going to actually handle it. And our handling code for it is going to half the mark and then update the current mark to be this half mark. Right? But in order for the quiz to behave like, like the kind of quiz this is, which is each answer must be right, I actually need to also throw this exception up. Right? So I handle the exception in my own way, but then I also pass it up to whoever called so that the user can retry. What would be the difference if I also do, if I also throw number format exception at this correct method in the division question? So here. Yeah. So well, what would be the difference if I just also throw an exception in the is correct method as well? So in the catch, like instead of returning, you would throw that exception? Uh, catching. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of catching it, you would throw it. But then you have to modify other code in your project, right? So the the kind of the requirement for the project was that you just create these two classes and modify nothing else. So you have to be able to integrate into the existing code. So surely you could, for example, not catch this exception and then let whoever's checking, whoever's following this routine, actually handle that exception. But then it would require for you to go and change this. So this is this is more robust because you can actually handle the arithmetic exception at this level. So you should you should use it. Um, so because because we were asked to not change any other um, classes. Uh, classes of the of the project, um, that is that why you try to catch it that in, um, is correct. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons is because I, I don't want this exception to escape because other classes are not aware that this exception may occur. Right, that's the first. The second reason is I catch it here because I can actually handle it. Right, so if I didn't know how to handle this exception, I would pass it on to my, to my call. But since I know how to handle this exception, right, I catch it here and I handle it. And the handling is really easy, it's just to return false. So you, usually you want to handle exceptions at the right level of abstraction, right? And so here in this class, I know how to handle that exception, so I'm handling it. Yeah. So in general, should you handle exceptions as deep in the type hierarchy as possible? Should you handle exceptions as deep in the type hierarchy as possible? Uh, well, that depends. That depends on whether you have the kind of the necessary information to handle the exception. So there's there's no there's no kind of rule of thumb here, right? So it, it could be that your design is structured in such a way that all of the information is centralized in some one component. So all of the exceptions need to get there before you know before you can take the right action. So it's a function of your design. Right? So there's not it's not always true that you need to handle it as low as possible. Yeah. Uh, how can we know that the try how do we know that the try block was thrown in our exception? So, yeah, so for that, you kind of just have to reason through it, right? So you know that when you're dividing two numbers, right? If you're dividing by a zero, what is the result? The result is undefined, right? So un this undefined result, kind of from a mathematical point of view, matches, you know, an exception that exists in general. So that's just... You know, that's something that you have to figure out in this case. Because the arithmetic exception actually is um, also, you can, you can look it up online. 
My arithmetic exception is a runtime exception, right? So this is what the this is what the hierarchy looks like for this exception. So it's a runtime exception, so it doesn't need to be handled. So if I didn't have that try catch, my program would still compile, right? Because it's not a check exception. So if I comment that out, the try and the catch, right? This program is correct, except that now this division can throw this exception, and this exception will percolate up, and there'll be a problem. So you could either discover this by actually testing your program. So you could run it and then enter zero for an answer, and then see it crash. Right? Or you could actually figure out and think through the fact that division is wrong. I think the assignment instruction actually said that you know if you divide by zero, it should it should be a wrong answer. It shouldn't crash. Other questions? Yeah. Would it have been wrong or less robust to just check if the string supplied the answer was zero? Like add an if loop to check, is that zero? And then return false in that case instead of throwing an arithmetic. Right. That, that's, a, that's another solution. It's, it's totally OK to do that. But is it, like, is it less robust? Or? Well, it is slightly less robust because your answer, here you're assuming that your answer is a string. What if later on I evolve my code and my answer is now an integer? So now my comparison operation has to change, right? I'm no longer comparing to a zero, I'm comparing to a zero, right? So from from perspective of robustness, this is this would be more robust. But this is also more robust, right? And this is probably a little bit less efficient when you pass a zero. Because this exception has to be generated, you know, it needs to kind of trickle up and so forth. So it's more robust, but I think it's more robust. Okay, great. Assignment number five. Lots of good questions. All right, so today we're going to be talking about object-oriented design. Uh, and the first step in that is actually to review the SAX parser code that we started on on Monday. So you should check out these two projects that we're going to be using in the lecture. So the first one is the SAX parser example, which we used last time. And then the second one was going to be the figure drawer starter. They're both in the lecture repository. So I'm going to take a, a different tack at explaining the SAX, the SAX parser example. So one way of thinking about the SAX parser, and this is kind of closely matches what you would, um, what you need to know for the project, is that when you write code, my code, you know, I have a bunch of files. So this is your, this is your code. This is your Java code. And so my Java code. I'm going to be using a bunch of Java libraries. Right. So there's some Java standard library. And these libraries are things like string, maybe set, list. It's like a very rich collection of, of stuff. So my code is going to be using these things. But if you were to just build a program using your code and then the Java standard library, you wouldn't get very far because you need to write a lot of code if your application is very complex. <laughs> so if you're attempting to write an Android application from scratch just using these, then you're going to be writing a lot of code. So there's kind of another, another set of things <coughs> that we typically use when we develop large applications. And we typically call these either libraries or framework. And your code is going to be using these as well. So examples, example of these things are so the, the SAX parser. Or the library is an example of this. When I'm parsing my XML code, I'm not actually writing code to read the file, to read the next string in that file, you know, to interpret that string. The SAX parser is actually doing a lot of work for me. The Android 
as the key that you're going to be using for the project. There's also an example of that. It's a framework. There's a lot of rich classes that interface with the Android platform, and you're going to be taking advantage of those. Right, there's a bunch of examples here. So for like machine learning, you might use a library called Weka. So that means you're going to have to re we implement a lot of the machine learning algorithms. You can reuse the ones that are already there. But this is really powerful. So the so the sex, another way to understand the this parser that we looked at last time, the sex parser example, is to think of it in terms of this library approach. So when I open my library parser test, my you know I'm going to import a bunch of things. So this is how I use libraries and frameworks. So Sax parser is located in org XML sax. And down below, I'm actually using the sax parser. And remember, it's an event driven style. So I'm going to create a reader. I'm going to create my parser. And then I'm going to call reader.parse. So this is where most of the magic happens. Right? This, this reader is going to magically use my library to parse this XML file, this library.xml. Even though I've written very little code, my library parser is actually really small. So the way the way this guy looks now is that I have my my org, you know what, what was it? Org XML sax. So this is my library. And then I have some default handler. That lives in this library. And it has methods like start element and start document. So what we did in the project is to create a library parser. And the library parser extended this default handler. So back to the ML class diagrams, I'm going to draw my library handler as a subclass. And so the library handler, in order to actually use all this, this functionality, in my SAC library, it needs to override all of these methods. So here, I'm going to have definitions for each of, you know, start document and start element. But I'm going to have my own way of dealing with these. So by defining this, this library handler and giving it to the SAC library, I'm going to let it invoke these functionality, these methods, whenever a new element is found, whenever the document starts. Right, so if we look in the, the library parser, internally it overrides a bunch of methods that it inherited from the default handler. So I could override star document, it overrides start element, characters, end element, and end document. So where are these going to be called? I don't know exactly. But by defining them and giving them to the SAX framework, I know that they're going to be called when the XML you know, file is at the right position for me to parse the start of an element, the start tag, for example. And so in this method, I'm going to process the start of a tag. And so here's where I define my unique functionality to handle the start of an element. So remember, if I, if I run the test, the library parsing test, then my output it's going to look something like this, where it's going to say that we're at the start of the document, we're at the start of an element, we're at the end of an element, and so we're parsing books, and at the end of the day, we have some number of books in our library. All right, so I can, what I did just now, before class, is actually set breakpoints at each of these methods. Right, so these little blue circles, there are breakpoints in each of these methods. So what I could do is actually debug this guy and step through the invocation of these various methods. So when I'm debugging it, 
it's going to pause at each of the breakpoints whenever the method is invoked. So I ran it from scratch. Initially, it started with start document. And now the screen is completely empty. Nothing is printed out. So where was it called from? It was called from the SACS library. I don't actually have an invocation of this method, the start document method, anywhere in my code. So if I continue my code execution and just press play, start document is printed out. And the next breakpoint is triggered. So now I pause at the start element. So this is the first element in my XML file. So I can do this all day, right? I can press play and wait for another method to be invoked by the SACS library. So now it invokes the characters, invokes the characters again, and then it invokes the start element. So this was the library, so this element is probably going to be a book. Right? So I can, another way for me to investigate what's going on in this very event-driven program is to set the breakpoints and then, as before, just look at the execution as it happens. Run the program, see where it stops, understand how it got there, and then continue. So, kind of one more way to understand what's going on is using the sequence diagrams. Sequence diagrams are actually useful for some things, as it turns out. So in my code, in the, in the library parser test, So in the library parser test, I can think about the execution of this parse method. Like, what happens? So I have this reader object. It's an XML reader. So I'll say, OK, I have a reader. And it's an XML reader. And it has its, its life line. And then I invoke parse on this method. This is just like sequence diagrams, right? Midterm one, midterm. So we've created this object, I'm invoking parse on it, and now it's executing. So I know that at the end of the execution, it's parsed the entire library. And somehow, magically, it's going to make calls to my library parser. So this library parser that I created is another object, and it's off to the side. So I have my, my handler instance, which is a library parser. So it also has a lifeline. So while this guy is executing, somehow calls are made to my library parser. So the first call that we saw was the start document call. So I'll put it in. So I'll have start document, with invoke, and then I return. Now, I'm not quite certain that it's exactly this object that invoked this method. Maybe there are other objects, right? So it's unclear exactly where these calls are coming from. There's like a cloud of, of the SACS library. Right? But one way of thinking about event-driven programming is that I created this object, right? I give it to this library, and then the library orchestrates the methods. It figures out which methods to call and when to call them. So this was the first call, and then there was another call, which was perhaps start, start element. And then this call return. Okay, so each of these is an independent method invocation. And so I have a bunch of these until the last method is called, which is going to be my end document. And I'm going to return to my SACS parser. And then this guy is going to return back. So my, my file is done parsing. So another way of thinking about event driven programming is in terms of these sequence diagrams. I created this object. I defined all of these methods. I gave it away to the library. And then the library figures out how to call them. So I'm not actually invoking them myself. Questions about the SACS parser? And what this thing is doing? What is the IO exception and 
sex exception? Yeah. yeah, what are these exceptions? So, these exceptions are generated by the tax library when it's reading the file. So, one way, one reason they're there, and as you can see right now, the handling code just prints out the stack trace. So if I remove these, then my code is going to complain that I actually need them. So it's going to, my code is no longer going to compile because those are checked exceptions, which I need to handle. Right, so one is where I create the XML reader. So I'll just add surround with try catch. And then the second one is in my, um, well, there's a reason why the try catch was around both of them. So, like in this one, it's a SACS exception, so I can surround with try catch as well. But it's easier to just have a giant try catch block around both of them. So, this original code caught the two exceptions at those two different call settings. So this is just a way of making Java compile. Ideally, you would actually handle these exceptions there in some way. Like if you have an I.O. exception, then because, perhaps it's because this file doesn't exist at that location. So you'd actually need to read documentation to figure out what I.O. exception means at that location. document automatically is generated. So the start document method is a method that I defined within my library parser. And my library parser, remember it has this kind of this kind of UML diagram where my library parser extends my default handler. Right? So I, I overrode these these methods. And then these methods are going to be invoked by the SAX library. So I tell it what to do when you see a start of a document. I tell it what to do when you see a start of a tag, an element. Great. And so my library is now invoking these methods magically. Great. I, created, I created this reader. I called parse on it. And now somehow it's going to invoke start document. Now it's not my concern. Right? All I do is define start document, and I figure out what needs to happen. So I define these blocks here. But it's up to the SACS library to figure out when to actually make the application, when to call, when to call the code. Okay. Great. So let's talk about the email class diagram some more. So the class diagrams that we looked at before were pretty rudimentary. Right? So the you guys remember the credit card example. Right. So I have this interface, credit card. <coughs> and it's represented a class. And there are some fields here. And then I have my methods here. And then we define different notations for figuring out the subclassing relationship and the uh, implementing the relationship. So this was an interface. So I defined my abstract art as implementing this interface. And then I defined my two subclasses for the abstract card card, like the A sub card and some other card. So so far we've been dealing with UML purely from a standpoint of inheritance, right? Like, what is the relationship between the classes within my kind of type hierarchy? And also defining the fields and the methods. So when you're actually dealing with an object-oriented programming, object-oriented program that's more complicated, we can actually extend this notation to capture more things. Okay. So the example project that we're going to be using for this is called the, uh, the simple figure drawer. So you have a figure drawer starter, which is kind of a, part, <coughs> a partial example 
of this that we're going to fill in. So let me show you what this thing looks like. So this implements a really simple drawing tool, right? So I can create a new drawing, and then I can draw a rectangle. To draw a square, and I could draw a circle or an ellipse. Right? So really trivial program. And then after this, I could like move them around. Okay. So this is a very simple drawing editor. Now the question is, how would you represent this in the UML class diagram model? And so the, the model that we have for this guy would look something like this. And you can get this from the schedule page. So it's posted online. So if you want to download this video, you can just grab it. So what we have here is very much a UML class diagram as before. So if you ignore this part of the diagram, then you see that well, there's a tool class, and it's subclassed by selection tool and the creation tool. That's really familiar. And you have the same kind of thing on the right, where you have two kinds of different, two kinds of figures. You have the rectangle, and then you have the circle. But there's some more features to this, right? So before, I may have a drawing editor, and the drawing editor just doesn't fit into my type hierarchy in any way. It's not subclassed by anything. It's not an interface. It's an editor. So it keeps some state about some of the other objects in my program. So for this, we actually use different kinds of relationships. So there's two kinds. One is associative, and one is composition. So this relationship here, which basically is a, is a line between the two classes, is an association. And then this little funny looking diamond signals that the relationship is a composition. So association captures the relationship between instances of the classes. So the way to read this is that if I have a drawing editor instance, then that drawer, drawing editor instance is associated with multiple tools. And I know it's multiple because the star actually stands for zero or more. So when I have this line with one at the top and star at the bottom, it means that for every drawing editor, I may have zero more tools associated. Right, so like in this, in this program, I have different kinds of tools. Right, I have a selection tool, I have a move tool, so, but I have just one editor. And the way I capture that in my model is using this association. And then the second relationship here is the composition relationship. So it's very similar to association, except that it's, a, it's really a part, part whole relationship. So that means is that the parent, which is drawing here, is going to be at the corner of this little diamond. So it's the whole. And then it's composed of multiple parts, which are figures. So my drawing is composed of multiple sub-figures. And that's what this is capturing. So sometimes you can have an arrow on this relation. And what the arrow indicates is that the drawing knows about multiple figures but the figures do not know about the drawing. And that refers to the actual state maintained by the instances. So remember, we keep fields within instances to remember some state. And so there's going to be a field within drawing that will remember different figures. And so I can access all of the figures that are associated with the drawing using that field. But the reverse is not true because there's an error going from drawing to figure. Now, if there was an error going both ways, I could actually just delete the arrows, and then I would get a straight line, kind of like I have here. So the one more associative relationship 
is the one between drawing editor and draw and drawing. So it's also a one to many relationship. Where I have one drawing editor instance, and this editor may be associated with multiple drawings. Okay? So my UML diagram is now richer because now I can express many more things about how my classes relate and which ones know about which ones and how many do they know about. So instead of just encoding inheritance structure in my UML class diagram, I can now encode more parts of my application. Right? So we could take a look at this in terms of the actual code of this guy. So if you open the, uh, the figure drawing starter, you'll see that it doesn't compile initially. So we'll try to actually fill in some of these associated, uh, some of these relationships. So to start with, you can open up drawing editor. And drawing editor, if you look here, drawing editor needs to know about multiple tools. It needs to know about multiple drawings. Right? But right now, there are no such fields. Right? So right now, it doesn't know about multiple drawings or multiple tools. It knows about the current drawing and the current tool. So, and the code doesn't compile. So you'll go to the compilation prompts and you'll see that actually it expects some kind of drawing, drawings field. So we can actually define those. So we can say that there'll be a private list drawing, and I'll call these drawings. And likewise, I'll create another list to store the tools. So there'll be a list for tools called tools. Okay. So what I did just now is created two fields. And those fields are in the drawing editor class. So when I create an instance of the drawing editor, I'm going to be able to keep these associations, right? I'll be able to track multiple tools, and I'll be able to track multiple drawings that I create. Except that if I just created these, if I just define these lists, that's not enough. I actually need to create new instances of these list objects, right? So I need to instantiate them. So I actually need to initialize them in my constructor. So I would write something like drawings equals new Array list drawing. And you guys have seen array list before, so we can just use that. That container. So we'll do the same thing for tools. So what we did now is actually define the fields that will store these objects. And because we need to know about multiple tools, multiple drawings, we need a field that's able to track multiple objects of some form. And so this is, this is where the collections come in. So the, remember that initial figure that I drew for you guys? So this thing where you're building some code, you have some Java standard libraries that you're relying on. So now if you want to think about associative relationships, or compositional relationships, that you need to remember multiple objects, then what you need are collections. So in Java, collections are kind of the standard means of remembering, remembering or keeping track of multiple objects. Okay, so in your, in your phase one project, you're going to get this UML class diagram. That's a little bit more complex, more complex than what you're used to. And you're going to have to come up with the collections that you'll use for storing the different instances, so buses or routes and things like that. Okay, so this is like an overview diagram. It's also on the schedule page. You can find it. But it summarizes the set of collection classes that you essentially need to know about for the project. And it has some of the things that we've already talked about, like the list. You can find documentation for all of these online too. So I can find Java list documentation. And here it is. What is a list? The list is just an interface. And then you know that the implementing classes that are listed below implement that interface. And so just like in the diagram, you have an array list and a linked list. So those are two kinds of implementations 
of that interface. And you actually have this here. Here's array list. And here's my list. So you can jump to array list, and that's an actual class. So you know that you can instantiate it. And so down below in the documentation, you'll get a bunch of methods that you can call in the class to use it. And so this diagram summarizes some of the properties that you have for lists and their different implementations, as well as sets. You guys remember sets? Right, sets and lists? So there's different implementations of sets as well, and they have different properties. And so you'll need to use this in your project to figure out what container you want for these multiplicative relationships, like association and composition. Okay, so just to just to briefly show you this thing. So this is the diagram that you need to interpret for the project. So this is the UML class diagram that's posted online, right? It's linked from the project description page. And so it's very similar. It, it, uh, it's very similar to that diagram for the drawing, the figure drawing starter thing that we looked at. And so you have the three different classes. You have different kinds of relationships between them. And then it tells you exactly which fields you need and which methods you need to support. All right, so your job for project one is to actually implement these three classes and then figure out the right containers that you need for these. Because here, my bus stop has a set, which is a bus route. Right, so it returns a set of these routes, and it returns a set. But what kind of set do you need to actually do the bus route? That's what you need to use that diagram for to figure out which one you want. Any questions about this stuff or association composition? Yeah, the particle relationship. So as, the way to think about this is that a drawing is composed of multiple figures. Right? So it knows about multiple figures, but it's really a composition in the sense that a drawing has multiple figures. Right? There's no way to think about a drawing without the figures. Another good example is if I had a car. Right. Every car has wheels. How many wheels does it have? Hopefully four. Right? So I may have another class that's a wheel. And so I have a compositional relationship between those two. Every car has four wheels. So I draw my little rhombus. And then I draw an arrow. Except that now I actually have to tell you how many wheels there are for every car. So, but put the number four. So for every bar, there's going to be four wheels. Now, if every wheel also knew about the car that it's associated with, then I wouldn't have an arrow. Right? It would just be a straight line. Zero more. Yeah, it's just a shorthand. So. I could, you know, instead of a star, I could just say zero dot dot dot. That's another way to represent the star. The star is just something that we use very often in computer science to represent zero or more objects. So that's what it stands for. Yeah? Uh, you don't need to put a one near the composition? Thing. Yeah, I don't need a one near the composition because I know that there's only one drawing, right? Because I'm composing a single drawing object. Right, because the composition it talks about the relationship is usually kind of down. Right? If yeah. it was a straight line, would we have like not a composition and a straight line? Would we have a one? For the straight line, you have to label both sides. Right? You always need you need labels on both sides. So you know, my drawing might know about two kinds of editors. Maybe there's always two editors for every drawing. In that case, this one would be a two. So in the in the association relationship, it's never it's not clear, it's not fully defined to have the relationship with that both numbers. Okay. 
Okay, great. I'll see you guys on Friday. We'll talk more about it.